Einen schönen guten Abend, herzlich willkommen hier in der Schauburg. Unser Gast des heutigen Abends ähm, versteht ein bisschen Deutsch, aber natürlich wollen wir zusammen Englisch sprechen. Please welcome on this stage John Malkovich. Well, you have been to Bremen before, I think a mm -hmm. decade ago or something? Yeah, I think it was about either 210 or 211, I think. And it was Casanova Variations? or mm -hmm. uh, Called then the Giacomo Variations, mm -hmm. the, the opera, but uh, the film was called the Casanova Variations, yes. I think um, maybe you have people here, I, I saw some people from Hamburg, they may have seen your premiere of Just Call Me God, which was in Hamburg, mm. I think 2017? I think so, yes. So what I want to come to is, you are much more than a film actor, you are stage director, stage actor, and I think the, um, the combination of, um, of your work is, um, I know some of the musical shows, and it's, it's Very impressive to, th to see all that and uh, to know just that it's one person doing this, having the energy to travel the world, doing a directing job in, in, in Riga and um, staying on stage in, in Hamburg and just one day later acting in Paris. But today we want to speak about acting and producing. Questions are allowed. There are some microphones, so if you like to, to ask something, uh, maybe use your hands. There are two wonderful colleagues uh, with microphones and that can help us so that everybody understands. I thought we need a topic because your life and your um, impressive li list of films is so long, so I, I chose uh, acting and producing because you do both. When did you start producing? In 1984, I think, I directed a play in New York. And I got a call at home, uh, and a, a, a man, I answered the phone, and a man said, My name's Mark Rosenberg, and I'm the president of Warner Brothers, and I would like you, and I said, <laughs> um, um, and then he called back and said, wait, wait, uh, and it was indeed Mark Rosenberg who ran Warner Brothers, and um, he asked me if I would ever consider uh, producing movies or directing movies, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, it's, it's never really thought about. It's not, it's not something I ever kind of thought about doing. But um, I did develop one film with them. Uh, took a couple of years, I guess. Probably called me, it was 86, maybe. Um, and uh, it was called The Accidental Tourist. Mm -hmm. And it was from the novel by uh, a most excellent American writer called Ann Tyler. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the first film I produced. Um, and I think for some reason they thought I was, I was going to be in it. And I said, well, why would I produce something I was going to be in? I don't understand why I would do that. Um, because I had developed it for Bill, Bill Hurt, mm -hmm. um, an actor I, uh, who was my favorite of kind of my generation of American film actors, Bill. And um, I had developed it for him to be in. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, I didn't do it for a long time. I acted in movies, I, I directed a lot of plays 
And then I started a company, oh, five years later, I suppose, called Mr. Mud. And I had two partners in that company, Leanne Halfon and Ross Smith. And we developed and made a number of films, um, Ghost World, Art School Confidential, Juno, Ripley's Game, um, which was produced with, with uh, my friend and colleague, Eileen Meisel, who also was one of the producers and developers of Les Liaisons Dangereuses. And um, we did a lot of films, How to Draw Bonnie, Which Way Home. Mm -hmm. We did fiction films and documentaries, and, and uh, we dissolved the company in 2017. But um, what was my interest in that? Um, I, th I think just, uh, again, really storytelling and, and uh, self-expression. And uh, I had great faith in my partners, mm. or I think uh, rightfully so, and, and um, I enjoyed doing it. Um, it's not, you know, it's funny, I, I remember when the English changed their tax laws in the middle of the night, and we, we were supposed to start shooting a film in London, and it, it kind of uh, was about ready to fall apart, and we were able to, to rescue it finally. But a, a friend of mine was the editor of the Daily Telegraph. I was actually the godfather to, to her first son, her first child. And, um, she called me and said, was asking about the glamour of filmmaking. <laughs> and I said, what a funny thing to think, Sarah. I mean, filmmaking is really, you get out of bed, you put on your slippers, and they're filled with shit. And yeah. <laughs> then right. you go in and you go, I, OK, I have to take a shower. And you turn on the taps, and shit comes down. <laughs> and you bathe in it then your day kind of goes like that, and your life goes like that. Um, but but uh, stories interest me. I like to discuss them. I've always loved to work with writers. Um, and that's the part of it that interested me. I think with being John Malkovich, this was also presented to you and I, if I remember it right, it was um, you should. It was planned that you play the main part. No, I. Um, I was doing a film in California, in L.A., out in the valley, and I called my producing partner Ross, um, who was at the uh, at the office because I was going back to Europe and I only had a couple hundred pages of a book left and it's a very long flight obviously from Los Angeles to get to where we live not in, in not far from Marseille. Um, so I said is there anything for me to read that I can take on the, the plane and there was a kind of long pause and then he said oh I've got something for you to read and I said yeah, what is it? I'll send it out. Um, <laughs> and I said, okay. And I got the script. I was uh, between shots on a film. And I started reading it. And it was spectacular. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, what a, what a fantastic voice. Um, what a really special, unique voice this writer had. And uh, I called Russ after I'd read about 30 pages. And I said, have you read this? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> and I said, and w what do you think? And he said, keep reading. I said, OK. <laughs> uh, and I read it, rest of it on the plane on the way home. And then I called Russ when, when LA woke up a day later. and. Uh, said I'd like to direct this and we could produce it. We had a deal at a company then called Castle Rock. And he kind of said, okay. 
Um, and uh, so I asked him to meet with this writer who was completely unknown, named, named Charlie Kaufman. And we asked him to, uh, I, I just said I'd like to direct it, but of course I'm not going to direct a film called Being John Malkovich, so let's make it about somebody else, whoever. I don't really care. And um, then we'll do it. And he said, no, I, I'm not interested in doing that. And uh, then we said, well, we're developing this film. This is many, many years ago. We want to do a film about Howard Hughes, the American, mm -hmm. you know, kind of madman. Yeah. And uh, entrepreneur and film producer and broad designer and uh, pilot and uh, kind of everything and all, all of them quite crazy. Um, and he said, and, and we were having trouble with the script and we asked him would he like to join us and, and do a rewrite of the script on that. And he said, no, that wouldn't interest him. And uh, then we had another film we had in development called Space Merchants. And would he like to take a look at that? No, he didn't care to. And uh, we said, OK, well, OK, good luck. Um, thank you. It's a great script. Um, and uh, I mean, it was obvious to me that no one would be mad enough to yeah. do that film. And then uh, some years passed, and whenever I went out to California during those years, invariably someone would stop me in a restaurant or in a hotel lobby or uh, as they picked up their car that was valet parked and say, why aren't you doing being John Malkovich? And I was just saying, what? what? Um, and. Uh, then I got a call one day in France when I was walking the kids down to their school, and uh, it was Francis Ford Coppola, and he said, um, would you do me a favor, and, uh, who I, I met before? Um, and I, just, I said, of course, and he said, would you go meet this boy called Spike Jones in Paris? And I said, yes, of course I, I would. Um, and I went and I met Spike, and I th I didn't really understand him very well. I, I may have mentioned the other day, I thought he was Czech, <laughs> um, because he has had such a bizarre way of speaking English, kind of surfer lingo, like, um, that's okay, but maybe, and things like that. And I just thought, uh, I, I said, are you Czech? What? Oh. And then I realized he was American. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, but why do you talk like that? <laughs> um, and uh, he told me his ideas for the film, which seemed suitably kind of wacky. And uh, I said, well, you know, if you can cast it, Spike, I mean, you know, call me and let, let's see what happens. Uh, and uh, then he got Johnny Cusack, who I knew and liked a lot, and he got Cameron Diaz and Keener, who I didn't know, but I sure loved working with. And, and uh, you know, I was pretty shocked when it got made, quite shocked. And. Uh, it, it was a very interesting process. I remember I'd never met Charlie because Russ, my partner, had met with him. And I'm, I had a breakfast with Spike and Charlie Kaufman in New York once the film was kind of finally got put together with all the, f all the things, you know, about the financial things and all that. And um, we left breakfast and Charlie hadn't really said a word during the breakfast. And, Afterwards, as we were going our separate ways, Charlie kind of sidled over to me and he goes, you know, I just want you to know I'm a big fan. And I said, Charlie, we don't have to do that. I read the script, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, 
but uh, um, you know, then it got got made, um, which I was really quite shocked by, and and uh, it was a very interesting experience. I would say one of the most interesting things about it was one day in rehearsal. Um, we we were rehearsing and and at the end of the scene or it could have been a, a dance the dance of despair or whatever it was I don't remember exactly what it was but Spike said y y you know J John Malkovich wouldn't do it that way and I thought what a fascinating mm -hmm. notion uh, <laughs> and I said. How, how do you think he would do it? Um, <laughs> you know, because I thought I just did it. Uh, so, actually, I would do it that way because I had done it that way. But um, it was a pretty funny experience, all in all. Um, you know, and he, he, Spike, actually, both Charlie Kaufman and Spike, they have certain qualities that would lend you to think they're a certain way. But in fact, they're both very steely and very, very smart. And they do exactly what they want. And, uh, you know, when I think of that film, uh, Spike and I, we didn't have a lot of arguments or even big discussions about it. Um, at that breakfast, they had given me a few days before a, a new script, which I had read, because I think they have thought all the, the rude jokes about me were part of my reticence about doing the film. So I kind of said, you don't need to cut those. It has nothing to do with anything. They're totally fine. Um, but the one thing Spike and I kind of argued a bit about was the the part of my best friend was written for Kevin Bacon, and Kevin didn't want to do it or couldn't do it or whatever, I don't remember. Um, and so he asked me about various people, Spike, who would be, and I said, Charlie Sheen, I think, should be my best friend. And he, he was shocked, and he said, but you, you know Charlie Sheen? I said, of course not, I don't know Charlie <laughs> Sheen. Um, well, why would he be your best friend? And I said, well, you know, there's always something with, with kind of guns and hookers and all kinds of stuff, adds a kind of exoticism. Um, and Spike was really dubious about it because he went then to visit Charlie Sheen, who was in, quote, lockdown, um, okay. which means somebody follows you around everywhere and really everywhere you go and really everything you do to make sure you don't take drugs or... Mm -hmm. or some illegal substance or what have you. And um, I remember when it finally played, when the film was finished and it finally played in Venice at the film festival, just the idea that Charlie Sheen was my best friend <laughs> was a kind of rolling laugh for 10 minutes. You couldn't even hear what Charlie said, just the concept of it. Um, and, but that's the only thing I think Spike ever listened. Really? Yeah, about from me <laughs> that I know of. <coughs> he was yeah. quite sure how John Malkovich is, or what, what kind of person mm -hmm. and everything. <laughs> Seeing the film again and again, I think I watched it for six or seven times, I have to say. It is always very enjoyable. It's very funny. It mm -hmm. You will see it tomorrow, some parts of it in, in our gala, because mm -hmm. that's, of course, when you award John Malkovich. Mm -hmm. You have to have pieces out of this film. 
because it maybe tells, and we now know not so much about John Malkovich. Um, but I just want to close that chapter. Um, you did also films like Juno, for example, which mm -hmm. is I, I adore. Um, but for um, being a producer and, uh, and, and an actor, did that ever harm the career? For example, being a producer, did that harm the career as an actor in that way? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think so at all. I, I regarded them as very, very separate things. Mm -hmm. And um, I had two tiny parts in films we produced, um, but really kind of one day parts in art school, confidential. I played a painting teacher who I think painted painted squares for 30 years, and then he painted circles. Um, <laughs> and that seemed doable. And uh, <laughs> then I had a very small part in a film we produced, not wasn't successful, called The Libertine, mm -hmm. um, which I had done on stage as an actor, uh, the part Johnny Depp played, Lord Rochester. But, um, uh, I, to me, they were com totally separate things, really, and I never felt it caused any trouble at all. I think here in, in Germany, it's quite n becoming quite normal that famous, the known actors, they produce themselves, they direct themselves, mm -hmm. and um, so it's kind of fashion at the mm -hmm. uh, during last years. Um, it feels like you chose to, to produce to really create the films that you, you like to see. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, the best energy that you can have to produce, that you, you chose for, for content, for, for stories, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, which is, might be also a bit against the system of Hollywood, which is so full of fear and um, not having no innovation, anything. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think, which film, which was the first that you did as an actor? Was it a, a wedding? Was this the first one? Well, n not really. I mean, the first film I really had a part in was uh, um, The Killing Fields. But I was an extra in The Wedding, a uh, Robert Altman film. Um, and... Uh, I am in, I think I may be in it for one or two seconds. <laughs> it was at a wedding and I played one of the, I think, a person who was supposed to be a bartender. Um, and oddly enough, it was a little scene with Geraldine Chaplin, who I later re-found in, in Seneca a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, the first film really I did was The Killing Fields. Mm -hmm. The fun thing is that I really, when you look into the films and you see who has acted with you, you're again and again meeting with friends or working with friends. Did Catherine Keener became a friend? No, I mean, I, I saw Catherine one or two times after but uh, she's, I think, always lived in L.A., and I'm never in L.A. Um, I had dinner one night years later with she and Spike, mm -hmm. um, and I'm super fond of Keener, but I had... It's hard to have friends that you stay in touch with. You can have people you really like a lot, but they're in Panama when you're in Shanghai, and when you're in Bremen, they're in Tulsa. And you can have people you really like to work with that you never ever see again. There are not so many in Bremen, so we are used to it. Yeah, yeah. There are not that many <laughs> Tulsas here. <Yes>. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. You have a strong, strong relationship. Oh, yes, maybe it's too much, but there is a relationship to the, to some of the 
big German names that came to Hollywood, like um, Wolfgang Petersen, Volker Schlöndorf, whom we will have on stage tomorrow. Um, so coming back to In the Line of Fire, mm -hmm. this was, I think, 1993 or four, something like this. Mm -hmm. Three. Uh, two. Was it something different to work with a German director at that time? Not really. I mean, meaning I knew uh, Volker I met in 1984, so almost a decade before I worked with Wolfgang. Um, and I knew Volker well. He directed a film of a play I had done on Broadway uh, with Dustin Hoffman playing the lead called Death of a Salesman. And uh, I was super fond of Volker and saw him all the time in New York. And at that time, he lived in a flat on Carmine Street in Greenwich Village uh, at an apartment I called Team Germany. And mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, Volker, Michael Ballhaus, uh, Werner Herzog, and Wim Wenders. Um, and so, I, I used to see them quite a bit. I did two films with Michael. I never got to work with Werner so far, but I, I sure enjoy seeing him, and he's hilarious. Um, and the, the German New Wave was a, really a huge influence mm -hmm. on our theater, strangely enough. Um, this view of the world. Um, you know, the film, say, that Vernon made, which was set in Wisconsin, his reading of what Wisconsin is is so insane um, that it's better than life. Mm -hmm. And they were so funny and so odd. And so uh, watching Klaus Kinski and Nagire, Wrath of God, and in one scene his hunchback is like this, and then the next one it's like this. And you go, you know, you really can't do that. Um, but they did. And we had incredible respect and regard for them. and, and uh, so I, I love the time I got to spend with them and, and the work I got to do. I did two films with, with Michael Ballhaus and, and two with Fulker. Uh, and Vim was the replacement director on a film I did with Antonioni because mm. Michelangelo had had a stroke. And he, so he had, by law, to have a replacement there, which, which Vim very generously did. Uh, and I'll see him occasionally at a festival or something like that. But they were a big influence uh, in world cinema and personally on us and our little theater, which was called Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. And uh, so... When did you start that? 1976. Well, I, I, I chose Wolfgang Petersen because he did these big movies as a German director. Mm -hmm. He was doing the blockbusters. And, sure. um, and of course, I feel um, Volker is one of the most intellectual, interesting, curious person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And he, is, he stays that way. He's 85 now, I think. Mm -hmm. And he's still that way. Um, yeah, I called him a couple of years ago when the pandemic started. He, his wife had passed away the years before, and I thought, oh, I haven't heard from Fulger for a while, so I went and check in. And uh, I, I don't know, our times change in America. You go on daylight savings time, or you're not on daylight savings time. I never quite understood how it saves daylight. But um, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, but um, I called him and I realized, oh shit, it's not 10, 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock. And, and uh, 
he lives in uh, quite close to Babelsberg, outside of Berlin. And, but he answered the phone immediately, and I, you know, we talked for a bit. And uh, so he was 83 then, and he had just gotten back from a 16-kilometer run at 11 o'clock at night. Um, and I was worried about him. <laughs> it seems a little inutile. But, um, uh, yeah, he's a, a really a force of nature, Volker. And Wolfgang, strangely enough, was one of the funniest directors I ever worked with. Um, because I think people have this idea, say, if you do a film with Woody Allen, uh, you just laugh all day. No, the one thing you're sure of is you won't laugh at all. <laughs> uh, not that day or any day which has anything to do with it or that it simply will not happen. But if you do a film with, say, Bertolucci or Wolfgang Peterson, you laugh all day long. Uh, I mean, I loved... Wolfgang had a, a thing I'm just a sucker for. W what do I look for in friends? Narcissism, hypochondria. The other thing is any person who refers to themselves in the third person, <laughs> then I go, but I love this person. Um, and Wolfgang would say, it was really every day, it is 4 p.m. and Wolfgang is going to have his cheese and sausages. <laughs> And, you know, you just thought, but of course, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, he was just hilarious. Oh, uh, you know, very good director, but really a lot of fun, too. Totally against the German stereotype. You know, they all were. I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard to think. For me, it's hard to think of a person I've met in my life funnier than Werner Herzog. <laughs> you, you talked about Steppenwolf Theater. So a theater is mm, very, very important to you. You're acting a lot. What is the most recent one you do? Just opened a couple nights ago a new opera called Their Master's Voice with Cecilia Bartoli in Monte Carlo. And uh, then I'll go back to the production of a Siberian director in Amsterdam on the 14th called In the Solitude of the Cotton Fields. Um, and then in Hamburg on the 20th and 21st. And in between, I go um, cast a play. I'm going to direct at the National Theater of Bulgaria in Sofia on the 15th, between Amsterdam and Hamburg. Um, and uh, I'll tour in those. The piece tomorrow night is the music critic with my old friend Alexei Gudisman, who, who wrote and conceived the music critic. And um, I tour in several other pieces that either I put together or I work a lot with a Viennese writer and director, Mikael Stuminger. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of, that was the Casanova piece we did here in Bremen and elsewhere. And then we did a opera about the Austrian serial killer, Jack Unterweger. Um, which we've done all over the world and which I've toured. This will be my ninth year mm -hmm. um, in that, this fall. Um, and we did a piece you were at the opening of, I think, called Just Call Me God that opened in Hamburg at the Elbe in 2017, uh, based on the Idi Amin quote, Idi Amin, gave himself many titles, among which was Last King of Scotland, um, which is interesting because he doesn't look that Scottish, but um, uh, which was a piece kind of about a sort of Muammar Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein figure who um, is... Uh, 
forced out of power by an invasion, by a coalition uh, of countries. Um, so I still work a lot with, with Mikel, who, who wrote and directed the opera in Monte Carlo that opened the other night. Coming back to it, Just Call Me God, I also saw a lot of Trump in this play. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just the first year after he was elected, so... Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I thought just maybe one week ago about how many sides and, 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 and how much Trump there was already in, in Just Call Me God. Mm -hmm. And um, it is not those, those, it was not only about those dictators of the past. Mm -hmm. so I think now, nowadays it's about the dictators of today. Mm -hmm. And he's maybe one of the serious ones. Um, okay, but um, you mentioned a lot of plays. I cannot really um, okay. memorize um, a, a single song. Um, so how, how, how many plays are you able to, to memorize? Is it, is it limited to, let's say, two or three, or is there...? No. <laughs> I mean, uh, right now, I, I do a piece that I probably won't ever memorize. I wouldn't, not that I couldn't or anything, but I like it as a reading. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a new piece last year, uh, now almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, and then we got into legal things with a former uh, booking agent um, called the infamous Ramirez Hoffman, which is based on the great Roberto Bolaño's novel Nazi Literature in the Americas, which is, uh, for those who don't know Bologna, and apologize for those who do, Roberto Bologna was a kind of Allende baby um, who uh, left Chile, then he went to live in Mexico City. He wrote a brilliant book set and kind of about Mexico City called The Savage Detectives, a huge, massive book. Um, Nazi literature in the Americas is a book consisting of 40 characters and they're kind of fake obituaries of fake Nazis who never existed, who have idiotic literary obsessions. And it's quite brilliant, quite childish in a way. And I had always wanted to adapt it and set it to music completely, but I realized once I had adapted it that it would be about a week long. <laughs> and I thought, that's, that's a lot of music. Um, and a week's a long time. Uh, so I just took the last story, which is called The Infamous Ramirez Hoffman. So that's about 90 minutes of text but I have memorized um, this opera that opened the other day, the play I'll do in Amsterdam, um, a piece I do of a Schnitke composition, and uh, Ernesto Sabato novel called uh, On Heroes and Tombs. And uh, I don't think memorization is a big thing. It's just, it's just work. Um, you have to work a lot, um, but obviously I don't find it particularly difficult, and one is kind of trained in this job to do it. Theater, theater memorization is very different to movie memorization. Movie memorization, what's the dialogue? The dialogue is usually, fuck you, no, fuck you. <laughs> uh, I'll blow you away, no, I'll blow you away. Those are hard to memorize, because you kind of <laughs> go, what was it? <laughs> Fuck. Who? You. 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 Yeah. Because uh, there is nothing happening in it. <laughs> um, theater dialogue is easier because there's often something to it, mm -hmm. uh, or dialogue from literature. 
Not that all films are that way, of course they're not, but, but film is only in your short-term memory. I couldn't, couldn't tell you the lines of a single scene I've ever done. Really? Uh, no. <laughs> but plays, most plays I've done, they go into your long-term memory. So you can do a play for, I've done plays for two years, and it would only take a couple of days to learn it again because it sits somewhere else in your brain. All that takes, obviously takes a lot of time and energy. Um, tomorrow we will see parts of the music critic, mm -hmm. which is about some of the most known and celebrated pieces of music. And the... Um, the harsh critic, um, they, yeah, they had to experience when they were for first uh, published and, and uh, brought on stage. Mm -hmm. um, how do you react on, on critic? Is that something that really harms you in a way? Is that something you really... No. <laughs> I knew the answer, but it's... Um. It, I, I was raised in such a way that, that from the time I was a small child, I was told I was the person who decided mm -hmm. what I wanted to do, how I felt about it, if I thought it was good, if I thought it was terrible, uh, what should I do about that? So the fact that somebody else thinks something is terrible that you think is terrible, Actually, it's, it's not really criticism, is it? It's agreement. Um, and I think the idea that artists, and I'm afraid it's more popular now than it, it was, say, when I was growing up, this idea that when you do something that you view as some kind of artwork or some kind of self-expression or some kind of creation, and you put that out in the public square, this idea that that's all then going to be uh, adulation and tropical drinks on the veranda is, is not an accurate <laughs> assessment of a creative life. Um, uh, a creative life lived in the public square will receive great negativity. And why shouldn't it? I mean, uh, all of us watch something, listen to something, uh, look at something that we really dislike and probably should be free to dislike it and say so. Um, the The reviews in the music critic are very well written. You can hear what they're saying sometimes. You, you hear exactly what they're saying in the music. It's just that some of us like the quality they hate, and some of us would agree with them. And uh, the, the review of me is my favorite review I've ever gotten that I've read, which I don't do very often, but that I've read, I would never get tired of performing that review. It's so brilliant. Um, it's so filled with rage mm -hmm. and loathing and disappointment. And uh, it's so hurt. Mm -hmm. As he said, people went home with their dreams shattered. Um, you can't beat that. I mean, you can't pay for a review <laughs> like that. Um, so, you know, I, I just don't think rev reviewers, which, you know, now it doesn't mean so much it, 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 because everybody's a reviewer. I, I was saying. And yes, sure. I was saying earlier to have two friends who were super famous uh, actors in Russia um, and uh, actresses in Russia. And they went to a restaurant one night in Riga. And uh, 
they were photographed from behind in this restaurant through a window or something. And uh, they were speaking to each other. One is my closest colleague for, for 30 years, and the other is a super great uh, Russian actress. And they started talking about all the horrible comments they got for having dinner. And I just made them translate like 500 of them at dinner. By the end of the dinner, they were just crying. They were laughing so hard. The comments were so funny and so crazily concentrated on the event of two friends having dinner. Um, and I think critics, they have a job. Their job is to explain their reaction to material A, B, C, D, to the public who reads them. My job is not that. No. I have a different job. Um, so, uh, no, it doesn't ever bother me. And the fun thing I feel about critic is that you you can see the person behind that writing it. You can really, if you write, if you read it, you can see the person, and you can see, yeah, you see the you said rage and everything, uh -huh. and, and that m I feel it, it's something could be something positive. Of course, can't really can be. Um, I'll never forget. To, uh, there, there was a very good critic at the New York Times for many years called Frank Rich, who I didn't love when he, I didn't always love his reviews when he liked something. I thought his reviews when he loved something were fantastic, but when he hated something, those were the best of all. And once uh, there was a play on Broadway which opened called The Moose Murders. And in, I think I'll, I'll always remember the first sentence of Frank Rich's review of The Moose, Moose Murders, which was, from now on there will only be two kinds of theater goers, those who saw Moose Murders and those who did not. <laughs> And he went on to kind of compare it unfavorably in, in terms of its human cause to the sinking of the Titanic. And then it kind of went downhill from, from there and he kind of really cut loose, let's say. And, you know, to me it made the play sound so great. I immediately called the box office and I thought I'll get eight friends to come and we'll go see it. It must be just unbelievable. Um, and the woman, you know, with her New York accent, I said, uh, yes, I'm calling to see if I could get eight tickets tonight for Moose Murders. Oh, darling, sorry, you know, Moose Murders is closed. Um, so made it one night and that was it. But um, I don't think reviews don't have much power anymore. And uh, because of the internet, Things are much more uh, democratic, let's say. They're also more vicious yes. and quite un impolite, quite uncivilized often. But I don't really care. <laughs> I think a good review is, is, in my opinion, is just is really can be rewarding, so mm -hmm. I, I feel that. But all these, these even with real names, all these comments in the social media, everything might be fun, but most of it, sure. it's, it's, it's just um, not leading to anything. But do you remember some critic from Dangerous Liaisons? Do, do you remember something? No, I don't really. I, I mean, the, the movie. Mm -hmm. Not offhand, um, I don't think they were very good uh, for me. 
I, I was told, but I don't remember one. So what would you recommend? Because we have, of course, we have a little retrospective of, mm -hmm. of your films. Like we have Dangerous Liaisons. We have, of course, Being John Malkovich. We have The Killing Fields. And we have Red. So what would you, which order should we watch? <laughs> um, if, uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. They're so different, those films. Um, I, I think uh, Liaison is very well made. I like the cast very much. It's beautifully written. Um, Red was a lot of fun. It's very well directed. The first one by Robert Schwenke, the German director from Stuttgart originally. Um, and uh, being John Malkovich, I think, the, is distinguished, not, not at all by me, but by being the piece that introduced two very serious cinematic talents to mm -hmm. to a world stage, and that's Charlie Kaufman and Spike Jones. Um, and what was the other one you said? In the Line of Fire? No, The Killing Fields. Killing Fields. Killing Fields was, uh, again, a fantastic piece of writing by Bruce Robinson, who also wrote With Nail and I. Mm -hmm. um, terrific screenwriter. That was a fantastic script. Very cut in, in the finished version. Is, is, uh, doesn't have the kind of density and scope the script did. It's, it's, had some probably an hour, hour and a half cut out of it. Um, but again, very well directed by Roland Joffe, who wrote me the other day. Well produced by David Putnam, the English producer who had a lot of success and ran Columbia Pictures at one time. But in order, I couldn't say, I mean, they're so, they're so different. Yeah, because you have this kind of oeuvre, which is so, we did so many different films, so strong characters, so bad characters, which we always love to see. Um, so, okay, it sounds we don't get any recommendation to tonight, uh, so therefore I, I suggest we watch every, every of the four films in the next days. Uh, you can find them in, in the program. They are, um, yeah, I think they start on Friday, uh, if I'm right, but, um, yeah, so it, of course it's just a tiny portion of, of what you created and uh, the roles that you've played and we chose them for. And the things that people remember are not always the things that we remember, the people who do them, you know. Um, uh, I did, uh, say, a film like Klimt. Nobody liked it. Um, and I understand. Um, but I love doing it, and I am very happy I did do it. Um, and you do a lot of things that maybe didn't turn out as you'd hoped, but the you, what you really hope for is that the experience and the work on it was worthwhile f for its own sake. Because, of course, as an actor in this cinema, there's very little you control. Um, <laughs> but I don't feel that this is, some, uh, this is a problem for you. I felt this is, it's okay. No. no, it's fine. Because, you, you, as I always say, you you're a figure in someone else's dream. <laughs> and it's not my dream. Is that the difference? or between It is for movies. You know, I was saying to people I was meeting with today, I did a film some years ago called Ripley's Game. And uh, I did a massive amount of rewriting in that. 
and Liliana Cavani, who is some uh, Italian filmmaker and opera director, I, I think is very, very, very bright and who I like enormously. Um, I would write one scene that I thought she would like. I would like I would write one scene that I kind of I liked and I hoped she would like, and then I'd write the third time, same scene, of what I thought we should probably do. And there was absolutely no way to judge what Liliana would say. And uh, it's never what you thought. And that's why I loved collaborating with her. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't easy to read. Um, and there's so little you control in movies. And that's okay. I think this is the moment to ask um, which is the favorite film of yours here in, in, in the audience, because we have four films in the program, but I would love to hear which was the film that you remember the most and like the most with John. Can you hear some, please? <laughs> Very hesitant. Some others? <laughs> A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Fun. Yeah. Mary Riley. <laughs> Empire of the Sun. Well. <laughs> <laughs> after me. Okay, second time. <laughs> Any el anyth anything else? Any other movie that we have not spoken about? Something. This is what this is. Th I think it was the second collaboration with Robert. Uh -huh. yeah. It was. It premiered like last year, I think. Last year in Berlin. And you uh, and you meet again with Geraldine Chaplin. Yes. Um, I think this film is like one hour and 58 minutes long mm -hmm. and it has one hour and 54 minutes of you with the monologue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that one that you m remember? Because it's very, it's very like a, like a, like a play. Because, I, I mean, I remember a bit of it because later I did a recording for a classical musician, a pianist of the end of Seneca, of his monologue about kind of the end, mm -hmm. end, end of days, really. Um, so I probably have a vague memory of that. But it's just movies don't go into your deep term memory. They just really don't. Um. I found that one so so close to a theater play, which because <laughs> it's it's um, it's just you on stage. There are very few characters. They are <coughs> not important. It's just about you. What this this this. Yeah, cutting the relationship between Nero and you does to you and, mm -hmm. and, and, and in the end brings you to death, mm -hmm. uh, which I found is very theater-like, so that's, mm -hmm. that's why I was asking. Um, there, is, there are also some, some new series like, I think, the Dior series, um, which is, mm -hmm. I don't know if it already came out on Apple. It is in... It is out in America, I don't know elsewhere, uh, called The New Look. It's about the French fashion industry concentrating principally on Christian Dior and Coco Chanel, but also Balenciaga, Balmain, uh, Givenchy, uh, Pierre Cardin are, are all at least small characters in it. And I play Lucien Lelong, who owned a... a, a fashion house called Maison Le Long, who discovered a lot of those designers and employed them and, and uh, 
but uh, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. The films. There are things a little like theater plays. And just the other night, I had a call from a director, which was kind of my favorite performance. That. I had given favorite only to the extent that it was like a theater performance. And this was a little film, and he called me to say he wanted me to direct something, this, this person who directed this film, because he said, I'm a shit director, and you know, I, but I, I, I hope he'll look at this. And uh, it was a film called Color Me Kubrick, about a gay, true story about a gay English travel agent who, who failed travel agent, who went around pretending he was Stanley Kubrick mm. in, in London uh, like 20 years ago. And uh, I loved doing it. I had seen a little documentary segment about the guy. And he... He bragged about his American accent because uh, I think he had heard that Kubrick was American, uh, which which he was, um, and his accent sounded like uh, a Flemish person with Dutch parents who grew up in North Korea, <laughs> and got fucked by a telephone pole in Texas. I mean, it was an accent where you just went, wow, that's, that's a series of incredible sounds that don't belong together at all. Um, so every scene, I just thought, well, it doesn't really matter. I'll change the accent every word. Who cares? Nobody cares. They won't even notice. Um, and the film didn't work. Mm -hmm. And the thing about a performance is, <laughs> if the film doesn't work, a performance is nothing. It doesn't matter at all. Oh. The film has to work, and that's what, it's the only thing that counts. You, the amount of work you put in, nobody cares. Um, what you do, is it innovative, is it smart, is it clever, is it funny, is it all this, maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't matter if the film isn't good. But you decide yourself, you read the script, and doesn't mean that if you say it's a good script, it will be commercially successful. But Not at all. For me, the question would be, you decide on on basis of the script? Depends. Uh, I decide on the basis of it's how I make a living. Um, I decide on the basis of who's doing it. I decide on the basis, is that person interesting? Is that person capable of interesting work? Will this be a, a memorable experience on some level? Um, I did three films with the director Raul Ruiz, a Chilean director who lived and worked out in Paris. I would have really done anything with Raul. I really wouldn't have cared what it was at all. Um, I did three films with Manuel de Oliveira. I wouldn't have cared what it was. Um, and there are probably quite a few directors I'd say the same. What, what the script tells you gives you an idea, could this work, mm -hmm. etc. But say Manuel, he didn't really have scripts. so. There's some way you can judge. And then a lot of films are rewritten considerably, if not completely, um, once they know who the cast is. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons to do or not do a film. 
I think it's very <coughs> idealistic uh, approach to say I decide only on the basis of the script because, as you said, there are so many things change later on. But um, I think it's very great to hear that that open, uh, how open you speak about <laughs> also deciding for a film or a script that you that you don't like because yeah. it it sounds always sounds like that it is. Um, this is the, maybe the ideal picture of Hollywood, where mm -hmm. um, this is, you are just, you chose it, and it's, it's always perfect, and it fits, and everything is, is just like we always want. Yeah, I don't think that exists. I mean, uh, for instance, in The Line of Fire, I was doing a play in the West End in London, and Wolfgang would call me every day. And I really wasn't interested in doing In the Line of Fire. Uh, and he talked me into it, and I was super happy he did. Uh, he was right, and I was wrong. Um, and that's not a surprise. You know. um, and that can often happen. It's a, maybe not a good question, but I, um, through all the many films that you did, I feel that there is John Malkovich in every character. Is that maybe your answer to just deciding to do it? That you keep something of yourself and all that? I don't, I don't really see a reason. I mean, you can't really lose yourself unless you just, unless you're like a furry. Mm -hmm. um, like now I'm a wolf and I'm going to eat <laughs> in a cage of the floor um, with a doggy bowl. Um, and my friend is going to make a tail that moves. Um, I just look at how this character views the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Um, yeah, I can make a funny voice or do an accent or do you any can. of those things. It's, it's OK. but. You only have your sensibility in the end and your interpretation of something. Um, so I would imagine there's something of me in everything I direct and everything I write and everything I act in. Maybe that brings all that many different films together regardless of if it's just a um, fun series like Space Force sure. <laughs> <laughs> or if it's The Killing Fields. Mm -hmm. It is, I, I can see you there, just the, the tiny bit I know mm -hmm. and the thing that I, that I think John Malkovich can be. I'm not Spike Jones. I would, I would ask, but I, mm -hmm. um, um, and I would listen. Um, but I can see that in 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 nearly yeah in, in all of those characters and in my in my opinion it's it's the link and that's why you, you have an audience which is can be very can be old and young and haven't can be very intellectual can be very um, yeah just see you maybe in in one of those very um, current series and and. Mm -hmm still be attracted and, and, and um, interested and will recognize you, I think, in the next thing you do, regardless of, of uh, the, the matter it is about. So um, I think, do you have some questions? It is the, w uh, maybe you come back to Bremen once more, but it's for today, it's a once in a lifetime chance. Who is brave enough to ask? We have a microphone here in the, in the, in the second row. Um, hi. Um, my, my question would be, um, I'm not an actor, I don't know, but, but uh, I imagine it's quite hard if you uh, play a role and which is very eccentric or, or catches you very much. How do you come down from it? I mean, is it like, is it, is it, is it, is it really hard to get Back or is it, or is it something that you can just leave at the set then? I'll just leave. I see. Okay, cool. Uh, 
hello. hello. Um, one question. Uh, you have a very uh, big and uh, very uh, awesome career and uh, do many, uh, many uh, stuff. But my question is, um, do you have some moments where you don't have the energy to be that creative that you are? Sometimes you are, don't feel it. No. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I think of it as more therapeutic and energy giving. I don't think it's a takeaway. I, I think it's a put in. So m maybe that's just the way I look at it or that's my experience. But, no, I never feel that, really. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I have a microphone. <laughs> Hello. I'm here. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I, I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm here, hi. <laughs> Where? Where? I look to the right. <laughs> okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers in terms of, like, beginning of career or anything like that? Maybe it's a very broad question, but just in general. No, it's not a broad question, but I don't have any advice. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm very reticent to give advice about anything. Um, be yourself, don't be other people. They're already there. Um, The, and that's not even really advice, it's just kind of evident that y you have to be true to yourself and follow your instincts. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I'd be interested to know um, how you personally deal with setbacks and how this may have changed over the span of your career, uh -huh. starting as a young actor and now uh, mm. being where you are right now. Um, yeah. I mean, to me, failure is a constant companion. It's the norm. Uh, uh, you can be the greatest uh, soccer player in the world. Why don't you score 40 goals a game if you're so good? Um, if you're so good an actor in the theater, why doesn't the audience lock the doors at the end of the play and make you start the play again? Because you're not good enough. That's why. And so, f failure is your friend. It's your life's companion. It's your closest colleague. And it's fine. Um, you know, the ghost we chase won't ever be caught. Um, Uh, and as I was saying earlier today, I think even if you once catch it, you won't be able to hold it. So you, you have to get used to that. And you have to say, okay, well, tomorrow will be better. You know? And the fact that it won't be better doesn't occur to you until it's already the next tomorrow. Um, but you keep at it. And... Uh, Failure, I don't think I like it more than anybody else, but I bet I'm more used to it than most people. <laughs> um, and uh, it's okay. You, you, you can survive it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, over here. Um, <laughs> yeah, right here. Um, yeah. Uh, we've talked about Spike Jones and Francis Ford Coppola and... Uh, a lot of other directors, and you've also worked with the Coen brothers, etc. Um, would you be able to tell us who the best director is you've got to work with, and why? Is that a, a, are you able to pause, uh, to answer that? I think best is a very hard thing. It's a very difficult comparison. It depends on what you're talking about. Um, say. When I was a kid, the first person to offer me a film was Michelangelo Antonioni. And one thing you could say about 
Antonioni's film is that he had a really unique sense of how to put people in a geography, a really spectacular sense of that, or even against a geography. But then you would say that Paolo Sorrentino can put you in a geography, but the geography itself tells you what to do in the geography. Um, the Cohen brothers, there are two of them. <laughs> so, basically, the chances of, of them missing something are zero. Um, uh, all, pretty much all the directors I've worked with have... Oh, very positive qualities and talents, I think. Um, some are such control freaks that it limits them, I think. Um, that's a limiting thing. Uh, because I believe that your creative partners have to feel um, supported and free to create with you, for you, etc. Um, best is hard. Frears, I think, Stephen Frears is the person who I felt maybe understood acting the most and performance the most, because you see, most film directors don't have any training in constructing a performance, uh, which is a construction. It's built, like building. Um, their, their formation is in pictures, moving ones. Uh, it's not in constructing performance or eliciting a performance. Um, it's just not really what they do for the most part. So I, I would name a lot of very good directors all with a kind of particular quality and most of them not so many negative qualities. It's a tough job. Um, very hard, very physically trying, exhausting, long. Um, I, I finished a film in December called Opus with a young director and uh, I've done like a hundred things since then and he's still there looking at the same material and he'll be doing that in July and he'll be doing that in September. It's really takes a lot of uh, stick to itiveness, let's say. That's why you're directing theater plays and not so much. Mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love theater. I grew up in the theater, but uh, I'm not some kind of fake artist type or something like that. But I, I directed one film. I mean, I've directed unofficially a considerable amount, but one film, it took eight years. If I want to do a play, I can call a theater in Mexico or France or America or England or somewhere and say, I'd like to direct this play. Uh, I, I go in a few days to cast a play at the National Theatre of Bulgaria. Um, why? Because there isn't a lot of blah, blah. It's just, what do you want to do? I want to do this. Okay, when do you want to do it? In November. Okay, great. Okay, bye. Bye. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like uh, the theoretical, the yada, yada, the... I like to do things and not talk about them. I don't mind talking about them 
if they're done. <laughs> I don't care to talk about what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. But um, that's why I certainly, I, I've been offered films since then, but I've never really been tempted to direct another film. Oh, it just takes too long. Um, if acting and uh, producing is a way of uh, showing different versions of reality to other people, how did doing it change your perception of reality? Sorry, I couldn't uh, think of an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, huh. <laughs> I don't know that it changed my perception of reality. It um, maybe deepened my interest in reality, which was never vast. Um, and it deepened my interest in my interest in human behavior. Um, Because, of course, in writing something, in directing something, in acting in something, I, I, I look at, say, acting in theater. I don't know. This, I, I started to think about this when probably I was 50 or, or, or around. I realized what it was I wanted to say about theater. When I was young, I thought it's what I did that made the play matter or not matter. <laughs> But of course, that isn't true at all. <laughs> Acting in a play is like surfing. At eight o'clock at night, you paddle out on your little board, you turn your back to the sun and you wait for a wave. What is the, what is the wave? The wave is not you. You're the surfer. The wave is the collision between the public, the most critical element of theater. The wave is the collision between the public and the material. That's what creates the wave. And in good material, you'll pretty much always have a wave. And on a nightly basis, you'll either occasionally ride that wave right up to the beach and step off, or you'll give yourself a concussion and possibly drown. Um, but You don't create the wave. The wave creates you. Oh, that's what informs your um, emotion. That's what informs every decision you make is the wave. And in cinema, it's very different because you have to create those things without a wave. You have to make it possible for those things to happen. Um, and you can only do that by going, what would be a really compelling piece of human behavior? <laughs> that would make this moment or these moments or this story compelling. I, I, I'd probably put it that way. Thank you a lot. You spoke very well of theater, but uh, do, you like, do you even like movies? It doesn't even sound like there were so many, well, Not, well, not possibilities to act or to possibility to take the wave or something. So, uh, what do you like in movies? I've always liked the technical elements of movies and movie making, meaning um, when I was shooting uh, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, when I was acting in it, 
Stephen Freer is never one to dailies. That's when you had dailies every night. You watch the rushes. And Stephen Freer sent myself and the camera operator, not the cinematographer, who was an English camera operator called Mike Fox. And every day I would say to Mike Fox, no, I want this. And he would say, Johnny, you know, it's not a shot. It's not a shot. And that would make me crazy. Crazy. Um, then I would go to the rushes and I would see that what I had wanted was in fact not a shot. Um, and that fascinated me. Uh, so there was so much to learn Technically, pe people always said um, when I started in the movies that there, there was that I always found very hackneyed and an accurate phrase, the camera doesn't lie. And I always said, that's what it's for. Uh, are you kidding? Uh, this isn't real life. Uh, it's a creation. Um, so that's really what interested me, which is fascinating to do. If uh, somebody says, no, that was a great shot, but if you had done one more twirl or one more thing and you go, what? Well, it doesn't make any difference. Then you go and you look and go, yeah, one more twirl. Why did I say it didn't make any difference? Hmm. Um, so that's the, the, the um, charm and the interest of movie making T to me. What, what you can learn about that process, I think, has always, has remained interesting to me always. Yes. So, um one last question. Do you have uh, a funny story um, on the film set or in theater when uh, something went uh, terribly wrong to share with us? I'd have to think. I know once in our theater, um, I didn't direct this play, and I wasn't in it, and that night I didn't happen to be there. Normally in our, for the first four or five years of, uh, of stepping on the theater, if you were in the play, okay, or if you directed the play, but if you weren't in the play and you weren't on the crew running the play, um, you had to go and watch it every night anyway. The best story I remember from those years is um, one of our actors was supposed to have a knife in his belt or something. And then he was going to threaten someone with this knife in the play. And when he w reached for the knife, it was a kid I went to college, college with, uh, university with Randy Arney, a very good actor and director. When Randy went to reach for the knife, it wasn't there and he had no idea where it was. And it was the climax of the play. And I think he, he had a brilliant solution to that is he ran over, there was a refrigerator in the play, and he ran over and opened the refrigerator, and in it there was only one thing, which was a little little um, uh, jar of jam. And he opened the jar and he screamed, this jam is poison. <laughs> That's how he dealt with it. <laughs> which I thought was really admirable. Um, I'm glad it wasn't me, but uh, 
I'm terrible because um, I could. I've done plays where really I've just laid down and laughed on the stage for five minutes mm -hmm. because one of the most fun things you can do when we were kids, we would have, you know, in America you do eight shows a week. So the Sunday matinee is always people where I would be the youngest person now in the audience by like 35 years <laughs> and I'm 70. Um, so you would do a play, say, that was really successful and the very first line even would get a huge laugh seven shows a week and on the eighth show of the week, it would be utter silence. And I would just hit the ground. I mean, and I would just lay there crying for like three minutes from laughter. Just the, the, the idea that you can't kind of respond to what's really happening because you're pretending <laughs> something else is happening. It just cracks me up. <laughs> um, and I'm just terrible at that. And for some years I decided, you know, I better not do a play for a couple of years because like the last five nights I just lay on the ground and cry for like minutes at a time. And the audience is like, he really is weird, you know. <laughs> but you're just going, the, you know, it's a line in the piece I just did, uh, performing, say, singing, being an actor, performance, is often just an assertion. And for every actor or singer or actress, it can feel like a ridiculous pretension. And when something reminds you of that, um, it can be really funny because the thing you should never ever do is break character and laugh, but I mean, I, I've fallen on the ground and laughed so hard my head bounced 10 inches off the floor um, because of the general absurdity of, of it. Um, I remember once doing a play in London, it wasn't very good, and um, a guy going, <laughs> This play is terrible. Uh, boom. Uh, I was just out for like five minutes. Um, I, I played Lord Rochester in a very vulgar, very, very excellent play called The Libertine. And it ends with, he warns the audience in a monologue at the beginning they won't like him. And uh, at the end of it, he says, do you like me now? Do you like me now? Do you like me now? And a woman in the audience, when we played in Chicago, she goes, no, your behavior was terrible. <laughs> um, and you know, you just, you, who could not respond to that? I mean, certainly not me. Because, um, you know, we have to, who wrote this in the opera, it was just doing, you know, performers kind of have to strive to preserve the child within them. Uh, the sense of belief, um, the ability to play on, play like children meaning to believe. And, and uh, so when sort of disasters happen, 
I just kind of go with it. I mean, I once directed an actor who would make me laugh so hard doing things that were completely unacceptable. And every night after I'd seen it was a play on Broadway, I would knock on his dressing room door and I would say, and this person would say, yes. And I would say, hey, Raul, it's, it's John. Oh, you were here tonight. Yes. I see. And you'd like to give some notes. <laughs> uh, yes, I would, Ralph. Well. So I go in and m most of my notes were like, never, ever do that again <laughs> in a play with my name on it, ever. And he would just sit there, very, very happy. And then he would go, yes, I can see how you must have hated that. <laughs> just, but he didn't care at all uh, what I said. And whenever I forbade him to do something, he did 40 things worse the next time. And that never changed. But nobody laughed harder than I did, because I don't have any taste. But it, of course it was funny because it was so wrong and so obviously wrong. Uh, but he was really a genius at that. And his supply of bad taste and inexhaustible supply of bad ideas um, w was just, just was infinite. Um, but uh, I always laughed at everything <laughs> did like that. I just, thank God I wasn't on stage and just directing, because uh, the play would never have ended. It would have been like seven hours long, I think. Okay, now it's, no, we are, we are finishing now. But before I say thank you, I, I just have to um, do some advertising. Um, I would like to invite every one of you to the opening movie on Thursday from two wonderful, no, th I think three people are coming from Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is. <laughs> I won't be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are not. But we have you tomorrow. And on Thursday, we are in the same house here, we are here, having our oh opening nice. film. Oh, great. And I hope a lot of you will come. I also hope that a lot of you will watch the retrospective and also hopefully lots of you will be joining us uh, in our lounge with, which, is for, uh, which is our industry event and um, with workshops and everything. You can see the program printed out and laying in, um, yeah, out there. Please take it with you. Come to all these wonderful um, meetings and workshops and um, yeah and uh, hopefully we will also see lots of you tomorrow when you got a prize that you obviously deserve thank you john malkovich thank you, thank you. Thank you.